Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Ramon Roche. I'm Drone Code Foundation's program manager, and I'm joined today by a very special guest, Andrew Smith from Gumsticks. Andrew, say hi to our guests. Hi, Ramon. Thanks for having me on here. I'm really excited to have you here today. Hey, thanks for your time. I know you're a busy guy, and I want to make sure that we get the most out of your time today. So we got lots of questions prepared, and I want to make sure that this is an open conversation. Let me know if there's anything you want to uh, jump into while we're recording. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, well, well we, let's get started with a quick intro. Uh, why don't you give us a quick introduction to who is Andrew Smith and where he's coming from? Cool, we will do. Um, so my name is Andrew Smith. So my background is in uh, controls and robotics. Um, I'm originally from and still am live uh, in Ontario and around Toronto in, in Canada. Um, I got introduced to um, to PX4 to Drone Code uh, while doing some grad work, um, and basically just kind of building drone to su to support some research. Uh, and when I was, you know, trying to get uh, devices up and running, ended up looking to PX4, and this was many years ago, um, and ended up, you know, at that time wanting to do uh, essentially like the Pixoc, the original Pixoc connected to a companion computer. Um, Pixoc was good, but we just didn't, you know, I wanted to do some extra stuff on top of it. And so that's when I just kind of looked at Gum6. Um, and essentially making a connection between some companion computer to a, with a, um, a Pixhawk. Uh, and that led me down the PX4 route that connected me with Gumsticks. And then kind of when I was done school, worked for Gumsticks. And um, now Gumsticks has been acquired by Altium. Um, and that's where I am now, working with, uh, with the Upverter team. I'm the head of Upverter uh, at Altium. And, um, you know, we, we're probably going to you know, both of us slip up and say, oh, hey, yeah, it's gumsticks or you might hear the word Geppetto. And, you know, those are all those are basically gumsticks was acquired by by Altium. Um, it's it's still it's still there. But you usually what you'll hear is us say um, it's you know the parent company is Altium. The product Geppetto has been transitioned and rebranded into Upverter. Um, so I, so if, if you catch us uh, saying one or the other, really, we that's what we mean. It's Upverter and Altium. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I was actually going to bring that up in a second. <laughs> so that, that's actually a great intro because you, you're touching a lot of topics here and mainly about how you got involved with Altium as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and then you're involved with drones and how you got involved with Altium. And and it, I guess it, it it we should ask this question. Like, what, what does Altium do, Andrew? So Altium, I think they started as... Protel, I think way back when, but really what they do is their software. It's a software company that uh, is designed, it's, they um, produce uh, like ECAD uh, software to, you know, you want to make a PCB for routing. And right now it's one of, you know, depending on who you ask, it's one of the three major Altium designers, one of the three major um, software design tools. Like I'm going to be biased and say that I like it best, but, you know, it's one of the major ones. Um, and the past, uh, I guess it's been the last year or two, um, they've been starting to push more. They, they want to do more cloud-based stuff. And then now, just in January, uh, they um, released a product called uh, Ultimade. And now it's essentially getting into the manufacturing business. Uh, and Gumsticks has been doing this for a while, whether, we're building, whether they're building like... Um, actual computer on modules or baseboards to support them um, and designing it on the web. And so it made a lot of sense for Altium to acquire that because that was kind of where they wanted to go in the cloud and manufacturing. Um, so really Altium is doing this PCB design software, but it's, it's a, um, you know, a big, they're trying to kind of revolutionize it and make this change, not, not keep doing the same tools over and over where you're, you know, you're dragging lines and you're sticking chips on, but okay, how can we progress the state of the art? And so now they're taking these tools and they're putting them in the cloud or they're, they're interconnecting um, different products. There's a new Altium 
ecosystem, we call it, is Nexar. And it's essentially pulling all these different tools you'd use for your electronic design, whether it's the actual design or you're trying to find out where your parts come from, like Octopart. It's pulling in all the information. Uh, it's pulling in many, uh, information from manufacturers. So it's generating API so you can send um, your designs out to manufacturer. It's um, you know making designing easier, which is what Upverter is does is it's you know more of a drag and drop modular design there's the original circuit editor for um, upverter uh, which we do some education on so it's just it's it's everything about designing um de designing electron like electronic systems and uh from the, the beginning on choosing your parts making the boards all the way through to delivery testing and um kind of provisioning nice so it's sort of taking on from going from the ECAT solution to the whole life cycle of the hardware. Yeah, so that's what it's for transitioning. So the, the ECAD side was what Altium has traditionally been doing, and now they're they're branching out and just doing the, the whole pit the whole pick uh, the package and trying to make it easier for everyone. Nice. So and, one stop you know, shopping. I think we've been working together since like what 2019. Mm-hmm. And I sort of saw that transition has started happening. And I think it was already on the way. And, and uh, I was kind of talking to see like if everything going web and then everything being able to be accessible and having the, the, all the tools that have been added to the suite. It was just a really amazing thing to see, uh, which is amazing because now the whole PX4 drug code communities can actually take advantage of all, that, all of those features uh, with all the open standards things that we've been working with, which Let's, let's get to it in a second, but um, before <laughs> <laughs> before we, we, we talk about the open standards, like how do you personally get involved with Trunco Foundation? Um, if I remember right, this, like you said, it's a little while ago. I think what it was is Gumsticks. So this was when this this was when it was Gumsticks, and Geppetto wanted to support and kind of make it easier for. Um, people to extend the capabilities of what drone code and PN Pixoc and PX4, everything they're doing, uh, extend that and make it easier because it's really kind of those, that, those things are set and there's, you know, a great team at drone code and the PX4 who people who are designing these things and they're kind of making these standards. Uh, now we call them standards. Um, and, but the, I guess the average users, they don't need to change that. Like they know that works and they actually, they prefer not to work because you have some faith in, you know, that, that that Pixhawk that I wired in and I've got all these wires connected to this Intel or NVIDIA, whatever, Raspberry Pi, whatever it is that you kind of wired up together, you have faith in that Pixhawk's going to keep this thing flying. And I know that you know that you have faith in the hardware, you have faith in the software, so you know it's going to work. But where people, I think, have trouble or where there's more time spent is, okay, I want to take that and now I want to make it better. I want to make it smarter or do something with it. Um, and I didn't find there was a good solution for that. So at Gumsticks and Geppetto, we said, okay, well, why don't we help people make these bigger boards that takes that leverages the um, the Pixoc and PX4 uh, systems and allow them to add more things on. Um, so when we started looking into those standards, we uh, said, okay, let's let's implement this and let's get involved with drone code and let's help them out, help out the community. So you know, everybody can, we can make it progress faster. Yeah. And I think uh, it's been one of the uh, best uh, decisions that we together made in like putting all the open standards in, in your platform. I, 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 and I've seen those tools and, I, and you've shown me many times and how they look and how uh, accessible they are. And I, and I think it's sort of really amazing. And in particular, I want to talk about uh, the FMUV6U open standard, uh, which is the one that you worked out on. Um, I think this this was the first Pixel that actually had a, a Raspberry Pi in it. Um, can can you talk to us like? And I, I want to talk about a lot of topics here, like obviously about the open standards and how it was working with uh, the team and um, releasing an open standard. But also, I want to get more into why did you decide to put this board together and like the reasoning behind it. Um, and I, I guess we should get started with um, the open standard and how how was it that you decided, hey, I want to create this board and I want to make sure it's a Pixel open standard. And what was the process behind actually getting that done? And, and uh, who did you work with and, and how what did it take to make this? 
Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think where it came from is Gumsticks had a product. It was the AeroCore, um, which really was taking what was available for free and you know on, online, saying here here's how this processor set up. Here's the pins, um, and uh, took that and put it into a platform, but made some changes here and there, which ended up you know uh, ended up causing you know you're going to have to have separate software for it because there's different pin notes chosen and it just it w- it worked and so lots of people bought it and used it because i think we tied it into a actually we put it in a bunch of different platforms i think on a uh, the 96 boards we connected to one of their boards we connected to an overo and to a dual overo i think some of our comms um but it ended up that the software was kind of a pain to support because we made too many changes and in, it just things were different. Um, so the next time around, uh, we, you know, we were thinking, okay, how how to make this easier? When the when it came up, when the standards idea came up, or at least came to me, um, it just made it was made perfect sense because we didn't want to change anything. Those are standards, and it it just makes life easier if you just follow those standards. And then um, now all you need to worry about is okay, you've got UARTs on these pins, I two C on those pins. Where do you connect them? Um, so we um, um, kind of, once I looked into the standard more, I think I'm sure you were my point of contact that uh, we were saying, okay, we want to implement this. What can we do? And uh, I think it was a, the logical first step because we had already done stuff with a chip down with the STM 32F4, um, basically the original Pixhawk. Okay, let's do another chip down um, and did now the H7, which turned out to be the uh, uh, FMU V6U, um, and uh, really, it, it was it, it wasn't actually it was a lot easier than I would have expected, I guess, because we really you know uh, part of the standards that you got yourself, David, um, and Daniel had put together, and like between the software, the hardware, and design stuff, it was all mapped out, and we really just had to kind of it's almost like taking a data sheet um, from any kind of chip. And just say, okay, this is the the kind of your um, your uh, I guess example application kind of setup that you'd have in a data sheet, and then we just put it in, broke out those buses in the way that uh, Upverter does, and um, really a little bit of testing, and it was it's going. We're still having you know um, in this day we're having these manufacturing issues with having you know get parts, so we're not. I wouldn't say we're kind of um, at full bore with it, but um, so far, it, it, things have gone um, pretty smoothly and actually kind of getting it in um, and getting it tested and getting things working. Um, I think you had asked about uh, the Raspberry Pi and why why putting it on there. And actually, the yeah, simplest – I'm, I'm going long on all this, but uh, the, the, oh, the, simplest an, the simplest answer for that is I thought it would be cool. Like the, CM, the Raspberry Pi CM4 was new. We were kind of an early adopter for the CM4 when it came out. So we just said, well, why wouldn't you? You gotta, you gotta put a Raspberry Pi on a drone, um, and so uh, we were really, um, yeah, that's the easiest thing. Is I just thought it was cool, and it would, I, I could use it. Um, you know, you could think of all kinds of things to do. Raspberry Pi is easy to do things with cameras. You can hook up. We added a Coral TPU chip, so you can do some really cool and fast um, uh, TensorFlow uh, calculations. So it was. Um, it just seemed it's just made a lot of sense. Yeah. So what what's the what was the actual purpose behind the FMUV six U? So and did you base this out of the uh, on any other standard? Um, it was take so the it was basically just trying to get the newest. The idea was getting the newest um, chip on there, the fastest chip that's um, that PX four was supporting, um, and. Um, yeah, I, uh, I uh, it, it basically was just the newest, and we were trying to kind of come out with uh, something that's um, people were looking to transition to. So we want to give them something. You know, we don't want to put in, this, like, say, the FMU V4 or something older, um, because if somebody's already got a solution, why would they want to switch to that? Uh, so we wanted to go out with the, the most recent one, and when people are redesigning, when they're prototyping, um, they're going to look for the, the best and the fastest. So we wanted to um, kind of go that route. Yeah, and which one was that? Uh, you mean the, the FMU V6? 
Yeah, but uh, what's your MCU? Oh, it's so it's the STM thirty two F or sorry H seven. The H seven. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. giving you everything you need um, with within the FMUV6. So you based everything out of the FMUV6X, which is using the H7. And then uh, you took that concept and you put it into uh, the FMUV6U. Um, and then in doing that, you didn't only just make the hardware different, but you also made it so it targeted different uh, type of developers, right? Because now you put this in companion computer in it. and um, the way I see it, and the way I, I, I and the, the reason I like it a lot is because it's a really cool form factor. It's just like a single board thing, which you can just uh, put in a drowning and get going. Um, but I really like the fact that it's made for developers almost. Like it's it's really accessible. Um, did you have any of those goals in mind when you were creating this? Definitely, like in the small form factor, and you can kind of. Um, uh, yeah, you can kind of you can slim it down a lot more than you probably you probably could with some of the other form factors, and that's what we essentially tried to do with the um, the board that we created. We basically kind of tested it out on was with the uh, Raspberry Pi CM4, um, trying to make it as small as possible. And um, um, yeah, I, I'm trying to think on the other. Yeah, I. Um, yeah, and you know what? I, one really cool, good thing that I, well, not a good thing. I, one thing that I, I think we should be clarifying right now is like one thing is the OFMUV6 U open standard, which is being, it's published already. Go to github.org forward slash Pixar. You'll find the, the PDFs there to download the open standards. And then another thing is the reference implementation by um, Ob Berter, which is the FMUV6 U with the Pixar CN4. Uh, which is following on the open standard, but it's a reference implementation. That's the actual reference implementation hardware, which we're talking about. So in the process of Andrew creating this uh, new board, he created the open standard and actually made the reference implementation for it, which is going to actually be purchased right now. Um, but uh, what I was asking you and, and what I wanted to get into is like the fact that this is a very developer friendly platform um, is, is the differentiation between one open standard and, the, and another. And uh, not only that, but how can you implement uh, the open standard and when you're implementing it, you can actually give it another different spin on, on what actually the open standard was. I don't want to say intended to be because it's an open thing. It's like an open source, like it's not a complete solution. Uh, it's something that manufacturers can take, like like gumsticks in this um, example. And if you could turn this FMU 6U standard into another thing, and, and you had any other ideas about doing that? Um, I don't think I don't think so. Not yet. Like so, we we really tried to kind of take what I guess the baseline called the boilerplate of or of, of the design and just stick with it. We didn't want to go too far, at least on this first go. Um, I could see actually like there were some things that we followed um, and wanted to see if there was some interest, some use. Like for one, one example is it's the 6U. Uh, so it's supposed to be using high speed USB as opposed to full speed. Um, and that was originally added. It's part of the, uh, the standard. It's part of our module that we've got in Upverter but we don't actually really use it too much. Um, and I, I haven't found too many people that have um, have actually requested it or are making use of it. Um, one thing that I would probably, if I was going to go and redo it, where I'd change or kind of make an option for is um, instead of USB, that high-speed USB, Ethernet. Um, I think a lot more people are more interested in having those Ethernet pinouts. And, and essentially, there was a choice made early on saying, okay, do we do USB or do Ethernet? And there's, there are a lot of the, the pins overlap, so you can't do both. So you have to make a choice. And I think that one, that would be a cool thing to kind of uh, swap out and change is to make that available. So um, same, basically everything's still the same, but um, adjust things so that you could do Ethernet. So now when you've got some other companion computer, you maybe you've got multiple companion computers and there's a network switch on there and they're all talking together or you've got an external cable that goes out and connects somewhere else. I think that would be kind of cool. Um, so I think there is, there is could, there could be some changes we could do. Um, 
And the standard is kind of is flexible enough for that, I think, because it's it's laid them out and it said it's, it kind of gives the U standard and then there's the X standard that's got that. Um, and I think there there could be a way to to merge the two. Yeah, definitely. And and it's a great thing you, you mentioned Ethernet. And I think it's what well, it's I don't think it's actually where things are going. That's the direction that mm -hmm. uh, the industry is taking us. And uh, the network switch component, I think that's one of the biggest factors that I don't think a lot of people are uh, really discussing or implementing, which perhaps is something that we might have to discuss in the future into building into an open standard because it's it's actually uh, one of the things that I've seen manufacturers struggle with uh, where I think maybe we could help more. Um, and uh, now that we're talking about the flexibility of all the open standards and, and um, how that the FNUV6U came to be, um, I wanted to talk to you about the different open standards and different components that you've seen around and also about how is it that the FNUV6U is actually built into Altium and what is why is Altium investing in, in the FNUV6U? Um, and I, I think there's a lot to uh, break this into, but why don't we get started with, um, to begin with, how, let's say I want to purchase this FNU 6 year board, um, and I start testing with this and I like it, and then uh, I say, hey, you know, I want to make a few modifications, maybe not add Ethernet, but maybe I want to add uh, this different sensor, this different component into it, or, uh, maybe I don't care too much about um, the Raspberry Pi in it. Can, can any of those modifications be made and how can we go about doing those and how does Altium deal with those? And 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 yeah, like can you explain a little bit more about that? Because I, I think that's a really cool thing uh, that um, you as a company and, and, and uh, the services that you're offering. Um, and I think we should talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're when you're using the FMU um, 6U in in Upverter, uh, it's basically you drag it in and drop and drop it in. It's got all the kind of necessary or required um, IMUs that you're going or sorry sensors that you're going to need to fly it. So the IMU, uh, the barometer, they're all part of it. And by default, we're not you know allowing uh, users to bring those out or sorry to um, kind of customize that. And the the the, the the best reason I've got for that is just so we don't have to have uh, different variants of the software. So you, when when you boot this up, you've got one. It's one version of software that talks to this BMI, that that other, you know, Liz sensor. Those. It's basically it's it's the set same same standard. So generally, we're not change, swapping out those. Um, but where what makes it really easy easy to use is now you can you can drag and drop different companion computers. You could put a different sensor on, you could put a different header, um, you could put change the location. It's really kind of everything outside that processor is really easy to change in Upverter. Um, I'm not to say that you can't swap out those sensors in there. If you want to use a different uh, sensor set, that's just not something right now that is easily changeable because the whole idea with modular, the modular design is there are chunks of your design that are locked and they don't move. They they they're they're known good. That this routing is good. This part placement, whatever, all that kind of stuff is known working. So you don't mess with it. Um, and um, but but uh, I could definitely see a case where we have different variants of say the FMU six U that um, certain things are changed um, that allow for some customization. But generally, it's kind of which buses you're connecting it to, um, and not really changing kind of the pinouts of all the individual individual things. And how, like, I'm a, I'm a simple user. Um, I don't really know much about hardware, and I want to build my own FMUV six U based flight controller. Where do I go to? Do I need to um, talk to you about this? Do, do yep. I need to have a business account and yep. uh, with with you, or do I just uh, well? What do I do? Like I'm lost here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, maybe the easiest thing is I can just point it at uh, at Upvert or at the website, basically where you can start from there. So if I can share my screen here. 
Okay, the first thing to do is go to upverter.com. Um, it's spelled as you think, upverter.com. You'll become, come to this landing page. And this is actually your gateway to um, the original Upverter um, and modular, but you can see the start modular design is up here. Click that and it opens up this website that gives you some example templates. So one of the nice things that we, that we do is that pretty much every module that we've got in here, we try to um, build a board around it so you can actually sample it. Um, and so, and we build these boards. So it's not just, oh, we threw it into software and said, oh yeah, it's good. No, we actually build the boards. We test the modules, we test the designs and then share those designs. Um, so you can have something to base yourself, base your design off of. Um, and we're changing things a little bit, but you can buy these. Um, in the future, it's probably going to be a little bit different than it has been. We Before, we've had been on a gumstick store, and things are going to change a little bit. Um, I don't have all the details to it yet, but you will be able to sample these um, these boards so you can kind of essentially try out the modules before you, uh, you go in and redesign something that fits exactly what you're trying to do in your project. Um, so you land here, and let's just... One option would be you could take this design that we're talking about, the CM4 with the PixUp FMU V6U, and you can open it, you know, clone into your workspace, and you can start designing. Um, but let's start from scratch. That's um, um, a little bit, I guess, more interesting maybe. Um, and you can go and say, let's look for FMU. And we have two options. There's, we'll get into, I think, the FMU V5X um, standard, but right now it's the V6U and you can drag it on and you know it actually does look like the chip because that's what's on there. Um, now it's placed on here. Now Upward is going to start telling you, okay, you know, it's red. So which means red's bad. You need to add something. Um, oh, I need to add a 3.3 connector. Okay. Um, well, how are you going to get the power? Let's just say for now you're going to have a barrel connector on here. Um, so I'm going to connect it on and now it's connected. It's green. Green means good. Um, so you actually could, this could be a finished board. It doesn't really do anything because it doesn't bring anything out. Um, but you're just, that is a green design. It means electrically it's good to go. And now you'd start adding other things on, whether it's going to be, okay, I want to connect some sort of, uh, companion computer. Maybe let's, um, put that on and let's say we've done the CM4. Uh, is this the top side? Yeah, okay, I think that's the top side. And the CM4 is going to look for something as well. It needs power. Um, I'm just going to, for the sake of making my connections easy. Now, these two are actually, they're, again, electrically, but we want to have some connection between them. In this case, we use bridges. Um, there is, should be a UART bridge. Let's say a heart bridge, which is hardware UART. Um, and now we could actually connect these two together. Let's do telemetry. Uh, let's do telemetry two on this and do UART three. So now we have a FMU V6U connected to a CM4 um, design. And one thing that's been added recently, and you see these little colored things all over the place, uh, Upverter actually tells you uh, real time stock of what of these parts and whether it's available or not. Um, you'll see these gas gauges kind of saying, showing here. Um, the price also changes as um, things get more and cheap, more expensive, less expensive. It's something we've had, we've added in into Upverter to make your design process um, easier. So if you design something and go to, to, uh, to volume, you've already kind of got a sense of, okay, if I, I'm ordering six right now, but if I go to order a thousand in six months, am I actually going to be able to get these parts? And that, this kind of gives you a little bit of that information. Um, and it's also possible on some of the modules that if you don't, if some one of them is not available um, and you want to swap it out with something else, let me give an example of that. If you put in the, say, this regulator, which has a processor that's not um, easy to get, you can right click and there should be, oh, no, this one didn't have it. Um, some of the modules do have a, um, a replace function on it. So you can, um, it'll give you another option on it. It'll suggest other things. So really what Upverter is trying to do is just simplify your design, let you take a step up from the, you know, putting in resistors, putting in, um, you know, worrying about 
electrical kind of aspects, and now you just worry about functional. What's talking to what? Uh, what what needs to be connected where? Um, you know, in terms of you know da- data sharing, for example, um, rather than the low level stuff. And it just gets you going, kind of you know from here. We've now just created in um, in a couple minutes a board that takes an FMU six U and talks to a CM four, and we could put on some different connectors. Uh, suppose you wanted, these are also implemented in here, the PIXOC, different types of connectors. If I wanted uh, to connect in GPS, it comes in and I can start connecting that to um, the different stuff in here. And we've named the buses in here to make it easy. So we want to connect that GPS one, GPS one, and now we've got a the, the default PIXOC connector in there as well. And you could do the same thing if you wanted to have I2C, if you wanted to have um, uh, the PWM connectors, that's really, you know, as far as design, sky's the limit. You can keep adding things in here. And when you're all ready to go, uh, you can essentially check that this is green, hit the order button, and now it does a check. Um, it pops up a window and says, it gives you some information. You can go and check out, click order, and um, in approximately six weeks, uh, and that fl- fluctuates a little bit depending on now, in this crazy market we're in right now, um, you uh, would get a board that's uh, functionally tested, ready to go, and you know, ready for you to uh, try out. Well, thanks for the amazing demo. Um, I want to take the opportunity to ask: so, what if we want to do the Raspberry Pi CM4 uh, concept and but take it to, uh, let's say, an FMU V5X? And I want to build instead of the whole thing. I want to have a baseboard for the V five X. Would that be possible? And is that also available within Alberta? Yeah, absolutely. So actually, you can see right now I've got when I started to type in the Pixoc to bring up these connectors, it's showing the Pixoc FMU V five X connector. Um, so let's just say okay. You know, I've decided I want to move away from this chip down. I want to have a modular, the FMU V5X um, on here, which implements the PIXOC uh, autopilot bus standard. Um, and we're going to delete that and now drag this in. And that kind of that gives you the mechanical layout so we can see exactly where it is. I'm going to rotate it a bit to fit in here. And it needs 5 volts. Yeah, and obviously this is just an example. It's not an end product, right? There's no, no absolutely not. No, no, no. <laughs> so we're but I'm gonna just reconnect it and just show we've gone through now, we've still got that. And I think I was on five. So there we've made the switch going from a six U to the five X. And yeah, guys, exactly. It's not an end product, but that's as easy as it is as, as um all it's required. And I think I don't think I mentioned before, but you also get um if you're interested, you can start seeing the actual mechanical layout and see how things are going to look. Um, right now, you can dis- you can download and export as an STL, so you can get some mechanical information. Uh, we're working on that to get more of a you know like a step file. Um, so when you're designing a case around this or you're putting it in something, you'll have very precise uh, measurements on knowing where things are. If you're putting drill holes, if you're putting connectors, um, and make it easier to do that. Yeah, which is really important for the. Um open standards as well for the FMU V5X and 6X, which actually have this defined mechanical um, measurements that you have to adhere to if you want to have a compatibility with the FMU uh, modules. Um, and yep. you touched on the Pixel Autopilot bus, and um, can you elaborate a little bit on about the, what the Pixel Autopilot bus is um, and how does it actually help you get a baseboard going with an FMU V5X? Um, so the autopilot bus standard is essentially it kind of it lends itself really well to what we do in Upverter because that's that's what it does. It standardizes, hey, these pins on here are for UART, I2C, Ethernet, and just says this is what they are. So it's almost like it defines those buses um, and here's where they're coming out. And this is what it, it's a is a really nice fit for what we do at Upverter. So um, it, it allows you to not worry about all the internal stuff of what's going on in the FMU and just what do you connect to? Um, so in, in this case, it's, you know, it's bringing out the UARTs, bringing out the I2Cs and we can figure out, okay, what connectors do we want? What do we want to talk to? Um, and it just standardized makes it really easy that 
uh, you don't have to kind of struggle with um, just those internals and any kind of other customizations. You know, those pins are set into one function and use them as you please. Yeah, and then the Pixel Galapag Plus open standard is also available in GitHub. Go and check that out. It's actually really cool. And yeah. that, that's actually why I like uh, the example of doing this in Upper, because, yeah, you're taking the concept of all the open standards and all the different components that we're starting to um, standardize on that are really vital to the hardware uh, ecosystem of drones in the drone industry in general. I, I think uh, it's a really powerful example. And um, I, I guess we should co keep going with your example because you were uh, about to show us how to get the FFM UB 5X compatible baseboard, which is not limited to be E5X. Um, because by concept, it's uh, a pixel kind of putted bus baseboard, right? Not in a B5X or B6X baseboard. Correct. Yeah, exactly. I think we we had put this in, this name in right now to make it obvious to people is when they're using it, There's because um, when it was added in, the V5X was the only one that was implementing it. So it basically kind of said, you know, Here's here's this standard. This is the currently the only module that would, or the only product that could go. You could use it with it. And I think actually, you know, we don't have a link to it. Um, but um, really, uh, it, it does extend to. It is the autopilot bus uh, connector. Um, so it's not specific to that one. And as more products come out and there's more options, um, I expect that we'll change this to something that's more common. But right now, it's. I think that's the most recognizable thing. Um, that people would know to, to search for. Yeah, which, spoiler alert, many more are coming soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so actually, one thing that I should try on here, because we mentioned earlier that um, on Ethernet, um, we have a, so both both of these modules, let's see how this works out. Um, you need a bridge to kind of connect the two of these two things. And I believe so we have- you're going to add Ethernet uh, between the V5X and the Raspberry Pi or just Ethernet out? Just Ethernet between the two of them. Let me just make sure if nice. I remember how, how I had that connected. So you notice actually when I added this in here, it was the LAN 8742A. There was a big X with it. You know, a lot of the microchip parts, it's very tough to get. So I can't guarantee that these are actually available. Um, but um, well, let's imagine they are right now. Exactly. In any yeah. supply chain crisis. <laughs> so I've added that in. And so this, the LAN 8742 is just one RMII to Ethernet Phi. Um, it connects um, to the autopilot bus standard and then provides out, you know, your kind of twisted pair, essentially the, the, the Ethernet um, uh, pins. And the, the uh, Raspberry Pi does the exact same thing. It provides them out. So all we need to do is a basically create a, um, a bridge. And what internally what's going on with the bridge in Upverter is it's, um, it's some resistors. And you know, most of the time when we're actually uh, building up the board, we remove them and just actually connect. So think of it as just a short between, um, between those, those two phi's. Um, so I can connect that connect that and we're good. And what Upverter does on high speed signals like this is actually make sure that it's routable because um, if you know what's going on under the hood here, um, there's impedance matching and you gotta, there's just a little bit more complication that goes on when you're dealing with these uh, faster signals. So Upverter, um, make sure that when you go to build it, you're gonna be able to route it properly you know, inside the design constraints that we have to use for our manufacturing. Um, it doesn't mean that if you wanted to build it, you couldn't change things around if you're using, say, more layers or some other kind of different manufacturing setup. Um, but for ours, it puts in these high speed these high speed traces um, to let you know where it's going to be routed. And if I tried to, just to give you an example, if I stuck this, tried to, uh, it's generally it's pretty creative there. If I stuck it too close to the edge, it's going to say, hey, no, 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 you can't. You can't put that there because I need to be able to route it up to this spot up here. Um, so it lets you know, it won't let you actually make designs that aren't um, aren't buildable. And that's it. So for right now, now we just enabled a, you know, a high speed data bus between the FMU V5, 6X, the autopilot standard, the autopilot connector and the Raspberry Pi CM4. Um, that's really which, cool. Yeah, which is which is really cool. Like I use it on some uh, devices already, and if you're interested in things like 
Ross, which everybody seems to be, it's just super easy. And, um, it, it's a nice high speed bus. You can get lots of data back and forth between the two. Yeah. And I know for those of you that are not kept to date with PX4, um, I, I think it's good to mention right now that since we've had FMPV 5X and 6X binary support already, um, the Pixel Cut of and all the connections going on between back and forth are already supported. So Ethernet's already supported. And actually, the Pixel 5X and a few other products like the Ethereum SkyNote are actually already supporting Ethernet, um, which is a really cool feature. And in this scenario, I think it would totally fit if you had uh, an FMU uh, module, let's say, that is Pixel Cut of Plus compatible, like a 5X. Um, you would be able to use this and then uh, have networking going between the Raspberry Pi and uh, the 5X, uh, totally configurable between both instances, which is really cool. Like Andrew was saying, for uh, really high bandwidth situations or uh, really cool for uh, high latency where you actually need to get the data real fast and real accurately. Um, I think, uh, like you're saying, ROS is the perfect example uh, but I can think of other cool things that we could be doing with all that bandwidth. Um, and with, with that said, like, that's a really cool way of using the Pixel Gato Polybus and Alberta into, like, how do you turn one fmub 6 g implementation into a Pixel Gato Polybus uh, based implementation? And how easy it is to connect all of, of the different components? What other type of open standards and components are available in, in Alberta? So right now, the only other standard I believe that we've put in, so we've got those two, we've got all the connector standards, I think we've got all them, it's every, as they come up and we need to use them, we add them in, um, but I think all the PIXOC standards are in, all the connectors are in, um, the one that we're interested in putting in, but it's kind of, it because there's like, it, I guess it's a bigger question, is the payload standard, um, and that one's more of a mechanical, like electrically, we could definitely put that in. Um, but because it's there's a connector, there's a connection between those two, um, I haven't actually added in yet, but there's no reason why we couldn't. Um, if there was a demand for it and um, it, like it, it just, it, it's just interesting because you, you know, the payload revolves around how it's connected and where it's connected. Um, and it, it kind of defines some of the PCB shape. I just haven't kind of been able to figure out what's a good way of implementing it, but it's on the list of being able to do that. And maybe it's both sides of it. You know, suppose you want to go through and you want to design your own payload. Um, it makes sense that you have that, that payload standard in there on both sides on the bait and the main like motherboard or baseboard, you want to call it that is branching out and talking to the payload and also the actual payload that you're connecting in. So um, that's the only other one that I see that hasn't been in there yet, but that I could see people requesting. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a. Um, I, I won't. I don't want to say a question mark. Um, I think it's a more of a how the demand for it is, and uh, the actual reference implementation. For an example, between the payload interface standard and an actual uh, reference implementation of the whole, uh, let's say, the baseboard at this level. And I don't want to call it a baseboard because at that point. It, once you already <laughs> extend beyond the flight controller, it's not only just a baseboard, right? It becomes the whole thing. <laughs> yep, um, yep. And yeah, like uh, I think that's a really cool example. And I think we should show that in a uh, follow-up uh, interview. I, I really want to get more into the other uh, standards. But going back a little bit to the connectors, I, I don't think that's a, a small uh, thing. And I think that's a, a really cool um, feature. Uh, let's say, do you have the debug connector in there? Um, that's a good question. I don't see it. it's not showing up. Um, uh, it might be you have homework. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It might be that. Um, so the way we do actually all of those are implemented is, oops, is they're actually they're they're custom headers. So we we have this thing called and you can see the name custom modules. That suppose you have um, you you want to pin out uh, some JS. These are JST SHs, or I can't remember exactly which one they are. But say let's just search for JST. Um, you've got a five pin connector or four pin connector that you want to put in, whether it's vertical or right angle. Um, let's do this five pin and you drag it on your board and immediately it's going to come up. Oh, it's going to say I have to log in. Um, well, I'm not going to do that right at this moment, but essentially you get a pop up that says, Hey, what do you, what, what do you want pin one to define? How do you want to pin, define pin one, pin two, pin three? And you can define it. You can pin it however you want. 
And what we've done for the Pixhawk ones is just go through and do that work for you. Um, and I do think it does. I know we've used the, the, uh, the debug connector. I just don't know why it's not showing up on here. I've used it on, on, um, some of the boards. Yeah. And a uh, quick question is, is all of these information part here in Alberta. Can I actually see any of this in Altium? So right now that, so this is one of the new things that we're, we're putting out. Um, Right now, if you go, you can actually, you know, if I wanted to save this design and I can export it uh, and you could download CAD and you're going to download some files that are not Altium files, um, we're working to change that. What we plan on doing um, that's in the very near future is when you save a design, it's going to actually go into an Altium 365 workspace. So Altium is pushing everything to the cloud. If you were using an Altium designer, if you were using Altium designer um, and um, uh, and you want to share things with people, you can send it to the cloud into your A365 workspace. You can share it. There's version control. It's very, very cool stuff. Uh, makes it much easier to collaborate. Where Upverter is going um, in the next few months is you're going to be able to save your design and it's going to push those files into your A365 workspace. Um, and from there, you kind of get the choice on what you want to do with it. Do you want to, do you have access to an Altium Designer license where you can kind of, you know, customize your design. Maybe you're just using Upverter to get a really quick um, prototype put together, save you the time of having to worry about what does pin one do on this and kind of do all the, the really low level things. Upverter gets you 90% of the way, gets you into Altium Designer. You, then you can finish the design, add in some custom stuff and you're good to go. You can use Altium A to manufacture it. That's already available in, in uh, A365. So eventually you will see that your board show up there. And if I can share my screen one more time, just to give you an idea on what it would look like. Yeah. Um, now I'm going to go into, so there will be a button that you can push and it's going to push it into your Altium 365 account. So what that would look like is, let me share this tab to, here's a, an example workspace that I've got that's got some of our original or upverter designs that have been, um, that are in, um, in A365. So this is what you kind of see is where your design gets pushed into your own personal one. This is a different project, but you'd have your own workspace and you'd have these different designs. So um, I can click on this guy and I've already opened it up and let me switch, share this tab. Um, this gives you the design. You can go through, you can see the PCB. Um, there's 3D rendering of it. So you can go through and do some, some cool looking stuff. Um, and you could share this. You could, um, and you could, if you if you have Altium Designer, you could download it and you can actually manipulate it directly. Um, so it's pretty cool. It just it's it's just like the next evolution of Upverter. I, the best way I can say it is now it's really pulling Upverter into the whole the, the you know the 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 Altium uh, ecosystem, uh, and it's going to allow you to do a lot more things once Upverter is fully into it. So that's coming very soon that you'll be able to use Upverter inside. Um, the Altium kind of space. Hey, thanks for the, the quick example on how to like move things from Alberta to uh, Altium A365, which is a really cool uh, thing to do because like you were saying, there's you care you might care for different things. And, and I think this is something that is true for our community, which is really diverse is like, we might be caring for uh, maybe doing a quick prototype, which is great to be doing it at a, a burner, but you can actually do a complete product and product there. Or you can go back to Altium Designer and be working with your team or A365 like you're showing here or any of the Altium tools, really. Um, they, they offer lots of flexibility and having the um, ability to plug in the Pixel Open standards and uh, into your designs just by dragging and dropping here, it's actually really powerful. Uh, is there any last things you want to mention about that integration? Yeah, so like one, um, you, you kind of like we're hovering around it is suppose you, you, you do go through prototype, whether you've done it, you know, um, well, say you've prototyped in Upverter and now you, you want to, um, you put it in a product and you, you're happy with it. And now you want to go to volume and you're want to build a million of them a year. Well, maybe that, that's a, that's a lot, but that's a few thousand, quite a few thousand a year. Um, you know, we've got a team, um, that can do that. Uh, we've got, we've done that with products. Um, and it just, it's kind of 
why go out and outsource that? Because generally what we've seen is people come with a really cool idea. They build something in Upverter. And then when they go to volume, they, you know, they, they're not sure if they can kind of do that. And so they end up having another hardware team coming on. And I don't think you need to do that. You, Upverter will allow you, you know, can transition right from prototype into volume. And we just take out the headache of it. So you don't have, especially like these days where, you know, part, part inventory, like um, getting parts changes daily. Uh, we've got people on top of it. We have teams on top of that. So we, we make that transition from prototype to volume production a lot easier. Um, and you can just focus on, okay, what's the next version of my board? Or how do I get these boards into people's hands? Um, we're, we're, we're trying to make life easier for you um, by kind of integrating those steps into what we offer. Yeah, that's a really, really powerful statement right there. So it's just taking everything from concept to creation and helping you all the way uh, to yep. shipping the product. That's really cool. And um, and then you're talking about like providing all of the services to your customers. Uh, and I want to thank you for actually helping the open source community put all the efforts that we're doing with the open standards and with PX4 uh, back to uh, right in front of customers. And uh, also because, um, and this is something that I don't think I've mentioned before in this video, like uh, the fact that Alberta is a silver member of the Tonga Foundation. Um, and before we end our amazing interview, I wanted to ask you about uh, your membership and how has it been working with the community uh, now that you went from working with uh, within Gumsticks and working with this uh, uh, air core board and then transitioning to working with the open standards and then also like getting their drunk foundation membership. And what did that give you access to and how was that process? Uh, it was it was a pretty easy process, you know, you, you just kind of apply and go through, but it was a no brainer for us because, um, you know, you know, it, it, we're, there's a lot of knowledge and there's a lot of expertise inside the drone code, uh, foundation that, and we don't want to say, go out and just, you know, do something on our own say, Oh, here you go drone community. This is, uh, here's a product that you should be using. Um, we're not like, the, the Drone Code Foundation is is there with this ton of knowledge, and so we want to we want to be a part of that. And we're not we're not uh, we want to kind of incorporate that knowledge and that expertise into what we do. Um, so it's just it just made sense, and so it was a really easy um, decision to be made. Um, there's been lots of great uh, shared publicity back and forth. The, the access to resources have been great. Um, there's lots of you know extremely gifted and smart people who work um, inside the community. Um, that have helped us get the standard up to where it was um, and testing and debugging. And, you know, it just, it wouldn't have been possible had it not been kind of on the inside of uh, the foundation and kind of getting getting ac easy access to those resources. There's never been a problem on reaching out and saying, hey, I'm having a trouble getting this fixed. Do you, do you, uh, can you give me a hand? Do you have reference schematics? Do you have this and that? And um, it's been... Um, much easier than I would have uh, expected. So it's been great. That's great to hear, Andrew. And uh, I think the fact that uh, you've been such a great member of the community uh, made this so easy. Um, and um, the continuous work that uh, I think Berger and yourself specifically have been doing within the Pixel uh, work groups, I think it's something that uh, we should highlight here. Like, thank you for all the time you've been spending on all those uh, public meetings. I think we've been having meetings since 2019 and it's, uh, we went from uh, ideas to uh, concepts, ideas and uh, into implementation and prototyping and then actually seeing that whole cycle. And now we're seeing uh, Pixox uh, going out, the five, FMU 5X, FMU 6U, FMU 6X, and the many more that are coming. Um, and I think that's uh, really a team effort that uh, has been happening within uh, Drug Code Foundation. Um, and it's in part thanks to contributions like yours. Um, and I, I really like the fact that you said it's a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we worked really fast <laughs> to uh, give you the tools that you need and resources. And uh, I also want to say something for all the people that are looking at this video. Like, uh, Drunken Foundation doesn't really 
get any knowledge from anyone that's not a member. Like anyone can join the public meetings. Anyone can join and get the, those resources and help. Um, but being a member of the community and being a member of the foundation um, does allow you to have um, deeper access into the work groups, uh, more deeper access into the foundation that actually allows you to build those relationships and partnerships. And it's a different thing coming out and saying, hey, yeah, I'm also a member and I'm collaborating with all the other different companies that are here um, that actually care. Like you have, um, you actually care for this community and you care for the projects that are happening, which is not just the PECSOC and the open standards, it's a Q ground control, it's map SDK, it's map like, and it's PX4 output. And uh, having said that, Andrew, I think we're coming to a conclusion here. Um, and I, I want to give you some time if, if maybe we missed anything that we were, uh, we were supposed to be discussing today. You know, we made the script and we actually tried to follow it to the best of <laughs> our ability. Um, but uh, we turned to mid sense, you know? Yeah, uh, I think we covered a lot of it. There, like, I guess my only closing thoughts is uh, I'm really interested to see where things go like it uh, i i kind of try and keep an eye on the forum and just seeing what people are doing and i always think it's cool when someone says hey i'm trying to do um you know uh, obstacle avoidance anything that's kind of adding more intelligence to it and and i, I you know i'll sit there and think okay well, how would i do that and it's interesting to see how other people do it um and i i hope upper upper is a part of that and can make that integration easier um, so I kind of like challenge other people to, if, if Upforder doesn't have something you need, if you want to connect a, the newest and greatest, whatever, whether it be a Jetson with all these GPUs or it's something and it's not there, or if you're having trouble, uh, like reach out because, you know, we're engineers too. We, we like these cool applications. We want, we want to push, um, the community, um, and it will help the community so it can you know, achieve all these things and do really cool stuff. And so whatever we can do to help that, uh, just let us know. It might be things like, hey, I need this connector, I need this module, or I need help with the software and getting the drivers up. Because if you've ever worked with a NVIDIA, like one of the Jetson modules, you know that getting those cameras up, it's not a simple thing. And so we've got, we can we can help. Um, so um, yeah, just uh, give it a try and and let us know how, how we can... Uh, make your kind of dream or your idea uh, more of a reality. There you go. You heard from the man himself. And how can people reach out to you? Where can you find in GitHub, uh, social media, email maybe if you want to share that? Yeah, the email I think is the best way. We've got, uh, it's on the website. If I say it here, I'm going to get it wrong. It's something at upverter.com, <laughs> whether it's sales.modular or support at uh, .modular .com, something yeah, like that. It's probably um, a link down below here. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, the forums good. Like too. Like I'm. I'm on the the uh, the PX4 forums. Um, every once in a while, I uh, jump in when somebody says, "Hey, I'm having trouble implementing this or that, getting this pin out," and I'll kind of say, "You know what? It's just not going to cost you anything. Go to Upverter, throw a design in, download the CAD files, and you'll be able to see. Hey, here's how we implemented it, um, and you can take it and run with it from there. But um, yeah." Um, We'll, we're at whatever. There's, there's lots of ways to get to uh, get in touch with us. Well, that was everything for today. Um, thank you again, Andrew. Uh, it was amazing talking to you. Uh, I think uh, over the years that we've been talking, working together, uh, we've had a really good relationship, and I think that uh, we there's a lot of good things coming. I know there's a lot of uh, work that is ahead of us. Uh, and I can't wait for the next opportunity. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yep. All right, everyone. Uh, thank you again. Uh, and talk to you soon. See you in the next one.